Hello, I'm Sigrid Carlson. I'm an assistant attending epidemiologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I'm the director of clinical research at Josie Robertson Surgery Center. And I'm very pleased to be here today to present to you on prostate cancer screening in 2023 at the IPCU meeting. These are my disclosures and my funding. So where do we begin? Well, first of all, does screening work? Yes, screening does work in terms of reducing prostate cancer metastases and mortality. And that's been shown in the randomized trials, the ERSPC and the Ochoboy trial. In the PLCO, as you know, many of the control group also got PSA testing. So there was no difference between the trial arms. But if you take this into account in modeling studies, you can see that both the European and the US trials really provide compatible evidence that screening reduces prostate cancer mortality by 30%. It's also interesting to note that the balance of benefits and harms improves with time. So at 25 years of follow-up, you can see that the number needed to screen and the number needed to diagnose become more favorable with longer follow-up. We also know that the age at the start of PSA screening is associated with a greater reduction in prostate cancer mortality. So in the Jotoborg 1 trial, starting before age 55, half the risk of prostate cancer death before starting at, at 60. And given that the prior screening trials included men up to age 70, this really suggests that the effect size that were reported in those trials underestimate that of currently recommended programs for screening starting at age 50 to 55. We don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, as been suggested, for example, by the USPSDF a couple of years ago. So abandoning PSA screening is not the solution. Yes, there might be some harm reduction, but we might also cause other harm. So, for example, we now see a definitive and sustained increase in prostate cancer metastases in the US consistent with these decreases in PSA screening. We also see that the death rate from prostate cancer has declined from um, the mid 90s to, to through 2020, but has now stabilized in in recent years, consistent again with these um, declines in PSA testing. What we do know is that we need to use the PSA test more wisely. So even though the PSA test has poor specificity and there are a lot of false positives because the main reason for an elevated PSA is BPH, we want to use the PSA test as a prognosticator. And the PSA test in midlife really can strongly stratify long-term risk of distant metastases or death from prostate cancer at age 85. So this is data from the MALMA trial where you can see that uh, most of the deaths occurred among men in the top core who had a PSA above 2 at age 60. And in contrast, if the PSA was below the median, below 1 at age 60, those men were very unlikely to die from prostate cancer. They had 0.2% risk of dying from prostate cancer at age 85. So the area under the curve, which is a, um, a measure of predictive accuracy or how strong the PSA test is as a prognostic marker, is almost 90%. So the PSA is a really, really good marker of prostate cancer and lethal prostate cancer. What about genetics? There's been a lot of talk about uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in recent years. And so when those are added to a model consisting of clinical factors and calocrines, as in the Stockholm 3 test, you can see that, yes, they do add to the predictive accuracy or the AUC uh, a little bit, but only about 1% or so. And in the barcode 1 trial, which was a feasibility study in the UK of using uh, SNPs to target prostate cancer screening, the uptake uh, in that study was only about 26%. And what's interesting to note is that so far, no German SNP tools have been shown to discriminate men at risk of aggressive disease from those at risk of only indolent prostate cancer. And here's an example of a recent study uh, similarly showing that combining single nucleotide polymorphisms into apologenic risk scores did not show a stronger association with lethal disease compared to, to just the PSA test alone. So this is really at the crux of the problem because we do want to find the aggressive prostate cancers. We don't want to diagnose any prostate cancer or uh, overdiagnose Gleason 6. So if the potential of the opponent is unknown, how can we better stratify risk and discriminate between the benign and the malignant lesions? One simple thing to do and to consider as part of an early detection strategy is to repeat the PSA. It's a very, very simple concept and that's been known for many years. So we know that the PSA has a tendency to fluctuate between measurements. And so in this study by Dr. Easton et al., you can see that 
um, measuring the PSA again um, sometime later, the probability that it, the PSA test will return to normal is rather high. It's about 40%. So before jumping to biopsy, always consider repeating the PSA test. Some groups are uh, strong proponents of risk calculators. So for example, the PCPT or the USBC risk calculators, and they can really help uh, guiding the biopsy decision by taking into account numerous factors, including clinical information and family history and so on. But the caveat is to um, always use the risk calculator that has been developed in the population you are in to make sure that the estimates are calibrated and can predict the biopsy outcome well in that population that you are in. What about biomarkers? Well, this could be a talk in and of itself on its own. Uh, in the 80s, we used to have only the PSA test. And now in 2023, there's been an explosion of, of new biomarkers and tools in, um, in our toolbox in terms of early detection. And of course, we also have the new kit on the block, the MRI, which um, has been a major um, sea change in terms of early detection and using pre-biopsy MRI as part of our strategy. And the AUA uh, endorses um, MRI um, before prostate biopsy and all biopsy naive men. They do not recommend MRI for screening, but definitely before biopsy in among men who have no history of prior biopsy. The NCCN guidelines similarly endorses use of MRI if it's available and also says consider biomarkers that improve the specificity of screening. When speaking about MRI, uh, one recent trial that I have been an investigator of is the Göteborg 2 trial, which then came after the Göteborg 1 trial led by Professor Hugoson and his team in Gothenburg, and that was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine in December of last year. And here is the trial team led by Professor Hugoson. And the Göteborg 2 trial is almost twice the size of the Göteborg 1 trial, which is about 40,000 men who are then invited in the population surrounding the city of Gothenburg in Sweden. Between the ages of 50 and 60, and they are invited to regular PSA testing, followed by an MRI if the, the PSA is above three or more. And the whole idea about this trial is then to keep the benefits that we saw in the Göteborg 1 trial in terms of finding the high-grade disease and then reducing prostate cancer metastasis and mortality, but then circumventing the poor specificity of the PSA test, a lot of unnecessary biopsies and overdiagnosis. So really keeping the benefits but reducing the harms by adding MRI in the strategy. And so the research question is really, can omitting systematic biopsy for all men with elevated PSA and performing targeted biopsy only of MRI positive lesions, number one, reduce the risk of detecting insignificant disease and maintain the detection of clinically significant cancer. And so men in the study are randomized to either the experimental group that gets this strategy compared to a reference group, group in which all men uh, with an elevated PSA undergo systematic biopsy, irrespective of the MRI results, and also target biopsy if they have suspicion lesions. And in the trial, uh, and uh, three Tesla MRIs used uh, transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, still the, the most common practice in Sweden, using a 24 sector template and all the Images are read in a blinded fashion by a consensus of two of three experienced radiologists and the, the reader experience is more than five years. And a positive MRI is defined as a pirate's three to five. So here are the results. Um, pretty high participation rate for a screening trial at this day and age and what we see in all the other trials as well, around 50%. Uh, less than one had a PSA more than 10 and all those men were biopsied um, for ethical reasons. And then 7% had an elevated PSA, about three. Um, the majority, 95% underwent an MRI among those who had the indications. And the biopsy compliance rate was very high, about 90% in both arms. And so here are the results. Yes, MRI, um, PSA and MRI as a screening strategy can reduce the risk of detecting insignificant disease by about um, a, a half, a reduction by half compared to the reference strategy. And yes, it will remain and maintain the detection of clinically significant cancer. So no difference between the trial arms. So with that, we can conclude that among men with elevated PSA, limiting prostate biopsy to suspicious lesions on MRI, half the rate of detection of clinically insignificant cancer with a small reduction in the diagnosis of clinically significant cancer, or rather no difference between the trial arms. 
And so when talking about MRI, it's important to acknowledge that um, there is definitely some heterogeneity between these studies and um, where they were performed. And we know that MRI has a miss rate of about 10%. So the negative predictive value is not really 100%. So I always used to say that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And so to be successful, the concept of this pre-biopsy MRI requires really high quality MRI machines, the optimal reading of the scans and robust training program for radiologists and access to high quality targeted biopsy. So for all of this to work, they need to be uh, working all together. And so going forward, how can we combine these into risk prediction strategies? We know that MRI is expensive, it's a scarce resource, and it might create complex diagnostics chains. So, so can we combine PSA prediction models and MRI to achieve a more efficient diagnostics? And so there have been two paths um, or several pathways actually described using either serial risk prediction and MRI or include the MRI results into prediction models requiring MRI. So the sequence of these things um, uh, are still being investigated in, in several um, ongoing efforts around the world. And there are multiple things to take into consideration in terms of cost, convenience, anxiety, the value of MRI targeting, travel time and access, and initial versus repeat biopsy. So a lot of nuances that we're still trying to figure out. And in Europe, um, there's been a call to action for a Europe-wide population-based screening program in 2027 that's now being endorsed by the EU. And the proposal brought forward there is to combine the use of risk calculators, PSA density, and then MRI, which will ultimately lead to fewer referrals to, to both MRI and, and biopsy. So this is one proposed uh, strategy. Uh, another strategy is that proposed by the Stockholm 3 group, and the Stockholm 3 test is a multiplex test that combines clinical information, PSA isoforms, and genetics into uh, uh, an algorithm. And also, as was recently published or in two years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, Martin Eklund and colleagues showed that performing targeted and systematic biopsies only in men with positive MRIs, of, you know, following a, um, a Stockholm three test above a certain th threshold that decreased over detection and maintained the number of high grade cancers found. So, you know, very similar findings to the Yotteborg 2 trial. So there might be multiple ways to roam. And so there are multiple proposals brought forward in 2023. And several of these trials are, are ongoing. We have in Germany, the ProBase trial starting at age 45. The ProScreen trial in Finland, which is similarly a risk adapted screening strategy combining the 4K and MRI, the Otterboy True trial that you just heard about, and then two trials only looking at MRI, so the Reimagine in the UK and the MVP in Canada. So only focusing on MRI and uh, not uh, using PSA testing at all. And so, so far, the ProBase trial um, that compared 50,000 men invited to either starting at 45 or starting at 50 has shown that what we saw earlier, the value of repeating the PSA, that was one thing that was confirmed by this trial. The DRE did not have any utility in this age group because of the low prevalence of prostate cancer, which was only about 0.2%. The ProScreen trial is currently ongoing and it combines then, the, the, the rationale is to combining markers and PSA and then biopsy only lesions visualized on MRI and then adjusting the screening interval to baseline risk. And uh, this trial is large and population-based, done in Finland, similar to the Otobo 2 trial in Sweden, and then combining these um, PSA 4K score and MRI, and then using a flexible screening interval deter determined on by the baseline PSA levels. So longer rescreening intervals for those with lower levels. And the expected results is that about uh, 10 to 15% will have an elevated PSA. Among those, 5 to 10% will have an elevated 4K score, about 7.5%, and uh, MRI positive will be less than 5%. So you can really have this sort of funnel effect where you have fewer and fewer men uh, proceeding to biopsy. And so that's uh, another neat thing about this study design is that instead of focusing on ruling in, we can focusing on ruling out. So in the first, by the first screening test, which is just a simple blood draw, you can eliminate 90% of men to go on to 4K score and then another 30% and then another 55 going to MRI and then 50% of biopsies eliminated to biopsy. So a lot of unnecessary biopsies that can be reduced by this sort of three-step approach. 
And so far, nearly 60,000 men have been randomized, uh, 15,000 men invited, uh, again, similar participation rate as in the Göteborg and the Stockholm trials, and very high MRI and biopsy compliance rate. Whether or not we can abandon the PSA test altogether and just go straight to MRI is an open question, unless I mentioned the reimagined and MVP trials are ongoing. Uh, the, it will be interesting to see the number needed to MRI to, um, uh, to find one high-grade case and whether this is a, a feasible strategy, but really an interesting concept. And with that, this is all I have to show. Here's where we are in screening for prostate cancer in 2023 and a lot of exciting uh, results to look forward to in the coming years. Thank you so much for your attention.